I want it. Actually, most of my talk has been done by all the previous speakers already. <laughs> but I'll take this down to a more personal level at the ground. Um, okay, so this is the chain of survival, right? Right? No. What's wrong with that? And this is the reality that everybody who calls 995 expects, right? And in fact, this is what we really know it to be, okay? So, um, everybody out there calls 995 expecting that the ambulance appears now. Okay? And that's how we can do it. I found this on the web, I have no idea which city this is from. Okay? Isn't that okay? So, uh, so if you can spend money on that sort of ambulance, you see the new horse there, I'm sure you can make you know, instant the arrivals a reality. All right. um, but in Singapore, this will happen. <laughs> it's going to be stuck in traffic and it's not going to make it there. Okay? So that's going to fail. Okay. So I've been saying this a lot of times. Nobody can get to the patient faster than the bystander who's already there. Okay. So the slowest tortoise in the world who's already there is faster than a hare who's trying to get there later on. So I think that's the premise of why we do all this bystander CPR. So the real two responder is that first point of contact that you make when you call 915 or 911 or as a number maybe in your, in your country. Okay. So this is a picture of our call center and you saw some fantastic videos just now. Uh, so why uh, dispatcher assisted CPR? Uh, it does improve uh, survival. Okay, these are just some stats. Uh, and I think that in enough numbers, I think I won't bore you with the details. Uh, it works, and we've seen all those previous uh, uh, studies even in our own region. Uh, but a lot of people still fear this, and I think we saw this uh, study being quoted. What if I hurt the patient? What if the patient's heart was actually still beating? Couldn't it be? I mean, you're asking those two questions only. Is he conscious? Is he breathing normally? Can we think of some situations when they are conscious and not breathing normally, but are in fact not in cardiac arrest? <coughs> Immediately comes to mind stroke, hypoglycemia, the dead trunk person, drug intoxication. You could have a lot of situations when uh, the person was in fact not in cardiac arrest, but who would satisfy these two questions and even upon on his chance. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's a reality you might really fear harming this person. And even among medical professionals, my colleagues might say, are you sure you're, that you can pump on his chest while his heart is beating? I say, it's fine. Look at this paper, right? Um, of this group, okay, I'm just going to jump forward. Uh, what did I do? Uh, okay. So, yes, there were some reported uh, uh, adverse events, um, but predominantly they're harmless. And even if there were some fairly significant types of injuries, the incidence is actually very low. So I would encourage all of us to, uh, if this is a barrier to us in implementing uh, dispatcher assistance CPR, look to this study. Okay, so yeah, is 2% injury a good trade-off? Uh, to save maybe somebody who is still having a, a bit of a gasping compared to uh, you know, not doing it, waiting until the breathing stops as we said just now. So, if you include this question, uh, the word normally, you're going to save a few people who are in cardiac arrest who are only just going into agonal breathing before the breathing stop. That's going to increase the sensitivity. Yeah, you might have a few fractures in people who have, uh, you know, who weren't actually in fact in cardiac arrest. But if you waited till the breathing stops, you're going to miss this whole group. And in cardiac arrest, the sooner you attack to him, the better. Right? Uh, sure, you will hit, you will save a lot of brain fractures, but I'd rather be alive, you know, with some fractures than dead with uh, no fractures. Okay, so I'm just going to walk you through uh, simple uh, audits of what we've been doing. These are cumulative numbers; they are not trended over time, so it's average over years. And our earlier uh, earlier months were poorer. We started our uh, uh, dispatch assistance CPR program sometime in 11, uh, 2011 and slowly cranked it up over the years. And I'm just going to share with you uh, what we saw in 2013. Um, in that year alone, these are the number of cases that we have suspected out of possible cardiac arrest. And these were verified after uh, the paramedic called into the hospital for a standby for cardiac arrest. 
all your pronouns here at the scene, and that's what we call P0. Okay. Um, there were this many. Uh, we only managed to audit about 60% of them. There was a bit of uh, uh, technical difficulties in extracting every tape. Uh, now, how are our dispatchers doing? Not too bad. Okay. Uh, they're compliant, so asking the two key questions is the patient conscious, is the patient breathing, or like this? 80%, 80%, I think it's fairly decent. Uh, there will be 20% of people, one in five, will we still need to uh, you know, tighten the screws on, you know, counsel them a little bit. Uh, if they, uh, for both questions, we ask about three quarters, so there's no small gap there to work on. Uh, and what happened there? Why didn't uh, these questions get asked? Uh, if you listen to the tapes, many of those that uh, didn't get uh, those two questions asked were if the call was routed from 999. Maybe they watched the British uh, video just now and they said call 999 instead of 995. Uh, sometimes, uh, and there were a few tragic cases where the call was routed through uh, the bus operator's uh, call centre. Uh, there were a few young people who had a kind of arrest in a bus and they don't call 999. The bus captain calls his uh, own uh, call centre, who then routes the call to us. And at that point in time, we have no means of uh, contacting uh, the vice and the embassy to perform CPR. Uh, so in fact, this was the majority of the reason why we failed to do uh, those two questions. And sometimes the caller is not the, with the patient, it's often uh, uh, a child, who, uh, a son or daughter who's working, and the person who called then was their uh, domestic help. Uh, uh, once in a while, you get a uh, distress or uncooperative calls. Uh, language barriers in, uh, in a multicultural uh, society in Singapore, and where one third of our population are actually foreign, uh, language barrier is a concern. Uh, and lastly, there is a reality some of our cases are still not recognized, but it's not much. Okay, so when you ask those questions, you expect to get some response, right? You hope that every uh, caller will be able to answer your question. Is he conscious? No. He's not conscious. Is he breathing normally? No. But the reality is, um, I, I, I don't know, uh, is he conscious? You know, then you talk to the person, you say, hey, check whether he's conscious or not. Yeah, yeah, he is. Uh, maybe he's not. Maybe he is. You know, is he breathing normally? Uh, uh, I don't know. A little bit, slow, slow. <laughs> you know? Um, and, and so that's the reality. In fact, this is the biggest biggest challenge to our uh, ability to deliver good quality by standard CPR, I'm uh, sorry, dispatches to CPR. Okay? And being able to respond to both questions correctly, that's our number. It is still quite a long ways to go. Okay? So remember, it started out with 1122 and it's coming down uh, to only about half of them so far. Okay? Uh, and uh, when both key questions were in fact satisfied, we still only managed to get CPR done in that many patients, okay? Uh, but without both questions, an additional 50 uh, cases were added to it, okay? If I take that as the denominator, by the way, this average over the year, okay, uh, it is not very pretty, okay? Yes, we are seeing increasing numbers, okay, but there's still a long way to go with due to all those little, little barriers uh, that we are facing at the scene, all right? So why not? Okay, once in a while, you know, we are fortunate where there's a bystander uh, actually doing CPR. Sometimes a collapse, uh, the cardiac arrest occurs near a medical uh, uh, facility. Uh, once in a while, if you're jogging near, uh, eating, uh, when he's jogging, he will stop by and do CPR for you. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and all these other reasons are also uh, barriers to actually, despite diagnosing, actually getting the first compression through. Uh, and once in a while, our EMS do a really good job and make it there uh, before you can finish start chest compressions. Okay, I'm going to give you a few example cases just so that you get a picture of what's happening. This is a good example. You saw the, the gold standard video, this is a real case. Hello, Hello. Uh, I need uh, some, uh, I need uh, my mom, uh, she is suddenly not responding. Not responding, is it? Yeah. Okay, can I address this? Okay, um, no, 206. 206. Martin Drive. Martin Drive. Uh, unit number 11. 11, yes. Uh, 312. I hope nobody knows this patient. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a real case. Okay, so is she still breathing normally? Uh, now she suddenly stopped breathing, then uh, her 
Thì con đi So is she breathing? Yes. But her face is turning pale. So then the dispatcher is wondering, is she really breathing already or not? And the caller is still not able to give you that answer. Uh, so sometimes, you know, our, our dispatchers, it's, it's a tough decision to make. Do I really start CPR or not? We want to encourage them, of course, to do more. Uh, but these are real uh, barriers sometimes to actually getting it to happen. So uh, we've had uh, uh, two runs of the dispatcher calls in Singapore. This happened last year in uh, uh, February. I don't think I have time to run through this video. Essentially what we are doing here, uh, what we did here, uh, was to simulate a dispatcher who can't see the patient and a caller uh, and uh, the dispatcher trains with a script uh, you know, and uh, they just walk through the script. You know, this person calls, my so-and-so has collapsed, you know, uh, he's unresponsive now, uh, and then they will follow the script to ask the relevant questions, and this is a sort of a training that we do. Uh, and this is just an example of the script that we have uh, obtained from our colleagues and friends in Norway. Uh, so, just to end off, actually to, to make it really happen, uh, I think you need really a multi-pronged approach. Uh, and beginning with the EMS itself, you need to have continue, uh, uh, continued education of our team and when new people come in. Uh, we need to audit and review and educate them in a way we went wrong. And what we do is uh, regularly after they go off a night shift, we pull out the tapes, uh, the recordings from the night before, and we listen to some of them uh, and say, okay, this one you did well, you know, could you have asked another question to verify, and so on. So it's, it's as real time as you can try and make it. Um, but a public, uh, I think we have heard a lot about public education, media blitz, and bigger than we saw. Um, and we're going to start education uh, from young, uh, and also in good places like in the workplace and the schools. Um, but actually the hospitals can also play a part. Uh, we can promote CPR skills uh, in our patients. When the family members come to visit, you know, we, have, we could put up posters, we can pamphlets. Uh, set up courses for them, you know, while you're visiting your parent here, you know, maybe you could do a CPR, uh, a little practice CPR in the corner down there, set up a, a mannequin, uh, and I'm trying to discuss with my cardiology uh, colleagues to do something like that in the hospital. Um, Off-duty healthcare workers as volunteers, so uh, one of our friends, uh, and he contributed a picture to, to uh, my wife earlier, he's trying to run a uh, volunteer uh, project uh, for off-duty healthcare workers, to register themselves and make themselves available uh, for an emergency. Um, well, I'm sorry, I let the people start here. Uh, last thing is uh, technology. Okay, we can use a lot of uh, smartphone apps, uh, wearable tech, uh, you know, telemedicine. Maybe one day everybody has a Google Glass and say, okay, that is a cardiac arrest. Okay, you're not bumping big enough. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll end here if there are any questions. Thank you, Dr. Brown.